Hello everyone, my name is Varalika Mahajan and I'm currently pursuing Masters in Data Science at Columbia University in the city of New York. I am also a graduate assistant at Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub. Today, we are going to talk about data ethics and how privacy and fairness are very important part of the data available publicly online. So to begin with, what is privacy? Privacy is a basic human need. Privacy is not black and white. It is an exercise of control. Loss of privacy occurs when there's a loss of control over our personal data. For example, OkCupid publicly released the data on their uh, app on May 8, 2016. So the researcher who released it said that the data was already pub publicly available to all the OkCupid users. It was just formally and in a informative and useful way in the form of a data set which is used by him or her. Username, age, gender, location, all types of personality traits were released. But was this correct is the question. Was the OKCupid okay data actually public? The answer is no. OKCupid okay users may have restricted the visibility of their profiles to logged in users only. For example, even with our Instagram profiles, we have control. We can set it to uh, publicly available to everyone or set it to private on, or, and only accessible to the one we approve. So this data, when made publicly available, was a breach of privacy. So privacy is not a simple concept and therefore it needs to be guided by many mean, uh, rules and regulations. Here are a few examples. The health insurance probability, uh, pro, uh, uh, portability and accountability act, the family education rights and privacy acts, the general data protection and regulation act in Europe. So to avoid information leakage and unexpected dis uh, disclosures, we have these rules and regulations. Now let's take uh, the example of smart water meters. We think that these are just water meters. How can they be a privacy breach? Well, they can be. These smart readers actually can help one determine how many people are at home and at what times. They can determine the sleeping patterns, the eating routines, what appliances are being used at what time, washer, dryer, and more. It can also help them determine when the home is vacant and a lot more. So being able to infer from a set of data is also a potential risk. So privacy is actually a complex uh, phenomenon. Now let's take another example. The license pre, uh, plate readers. So cities are increasing using automated license plate readers technology. Camera systems are now installed at malls, train stations, airport, and even on the streets to detect uh, the card numbers who are breaking the rules. But this data, again, can help us identify the location of an individual at any given point of time. If not in the right hands, it is a data at risk. Obviously, it is good to fight the crime rate, but it is important that it is confidential. Apart from the loss of privacy to individuals, the information could be used for many different purposes, even for bad reasons. So understanding that is very important. So de-identification is a process used to counter this. For example, using an AOL user number of 4417749. Now, the mapping of what this number represents, which users, is confidential. So even with this data being available online, one cannot figure out what who the person is, what their name is, their phone number is, their addresses. So this de-identification can help us, uh, but it needs to be done correctly. Even if an identifier such as license plate number is not involved, there are questions about how and whether data collecting can be used to identify individuals. So this, this needs to be done very in a solidified way, right? 
For example, uh, in the Massachusetts re-identification incident, what happened was a medical data record was uh, released online publicly, which had the zip code, birth date, and sex to re uh, real uh, sex. Now, this seemed like we are not giving out direct information about main phone number, who the medical record belongs to, but a person named as Latanya Sweeney used the zip code, birth rate, and sex to locate the hair record of the then governor, William Weld. Now, this was a huge breach of privacy. His uh, diagnosis reports, prescriptions, everything was available publicly now. So actually, this movement, this event also led to pivotal revisions in the HIPAA privacy rule to restrict disclosure of full birth, uh, birth date and zip codes under the safe harbor standards. So even de-identification needs to be done correct correctly because some data points can help us reach another, right? Or a group of data points. Now, another example of how data can be correlated from one uh, data point to another. Netflix in a prize competition revealed a data set where they de-identified their users. They just give their user IDs, date, movie name, and the rating given by the user for that uh, movie. Now, Netflix thought this data was anonymous and nobody could identify who the user was. But the problem was the sparsity in the data of Netflix. In Netflix data, no two profiles are more than 50% similar. If a Netflix profile is more than 50% similar to a profile in IMDb, then there is a high probability that the two profiles belong to the same person. IMDb made use of this and started inquiring the users identified and talking to them about the movies they had watched. Now, this was a big breach of data privacy. So with all of this came the que uh, came bigger questions, the questions of how and whether data you release is safe, whether or not you can be identified using the release data is a topic that has been well studied in the computer science community now. One notion that has been formalized in this whole process mm. is differential privacy, mm. whose goal is to provide as much statistical uh, information as possible from data stored in database while guaranteeing that an individual can be identified. What is differential privacy? Differential privacy ensures, for example, that a person can contribute their genetic information into a medical database without the fear that anyone analyzing the database will be able to figure out which genetic information is, is his or hers. Or even when he, he or she has participated in the database at, at all, this achieves the security guarantee in a way that allows the researchers to use database to make new discoveries. Ideas from this research are now finding their way into practice. The U.S. Census Bureau is actually using it. The Google in also in historic traffic statistics is using it. So differential privacy is a concept which is gaining uh, popularity and is the correct way to go about it. Now let's talk about the ethics surrounding algorithms. We use different algorithms to make future predictions with the current available data. Now, uh, making these future predictions come with high risk. Past population cannot be representative of the future. They can be overfit, uh, for overfitting due to unrepresented data, which is a common thing that occurs. Training data can be unrepresentative of the whole class. So these are some of the algorithmic biases which can appear. To understand that better, let's see how good data can even result to bad results. For this, we will mainly study three uh, important concepts, which are correlated attributes, misleading results, and p-hacking. Now, let's understand with them example. The first is correlated attributes. Now, here we have taken an example. Staples, its office supply store, decided to win business from their competitor, which is Office Max, by offering a lower price online to customers living near one of their con con uh, competitors. Seems fine, right? It seems like a good strategy. But what happened? The Office Max stores were actually located in the areas with higher income and not in rural or poor areas. Staple was not intending to offer prices to people in higher income areas. They were merely trying to compete with Office Max. 
but there was a correlation between income level and where the office max offices were located. Now, this led to a very bad result on the economy. So if you live in a poorer neighborhood, you end up paying more than someone living in the wealthier neighborhood. Now, this was the lack of realization between the correlation between the two variables, income level and where the stores are located. So this is one example, good data and bad results. Another one, misleading results. Now, look at these two graphs present to you on the screen. The first graph, the graph on the left, you see a bar chart. It appears, uh, it shows the, how the interest rate has increased over time from 2008 to 2010. So in the left chart, it appears that there has been a dramatic increase in the interest rate from uh, 2008 to 2012. But is it so? Look carefully at the y-axis now. It was actually hardly increased point from 3.14 to 3.152. It is a very small decimal change, but the axis labels were set in such a way that it uh, it uh, made us believe that the, the steep was so uh, high, the gradual increase was so much. But if I plot the same graph using the same data, but a different y-axis, let me take a constant 0 0.5 interval and plot it from 0 uh, 0 0.0% to 3.5%. The same data is plotted at the right with that scale. So what do you see now? There has hardly been any change in the interest rate over the uh, period of 2008 to 2012. This is a very misleading uh, result. So this is uh, another uh, example. Let's go to another example of misleading results through a graph. In this figure, as you can see, the y-axis shows how different types of DBMS have changed in popularity. The important term is change in popularity. The lead, uh, so leading the viewer with the impression that the graph DBMS are the most popular. Now let's see, however, the relational DBMS, the one in the red, can you see at the bottom, have been around a long time and are very popular. However, their popularity has not changed significantly over the time period and they continue to command by far the largest share of all these systems in the market. The graphic is highly misleading since it leads you to believe that the relational DBMS are losing with respect to no SQL system, but that is not the case. It's just a misleading access label. Now, the third thing is P hacking. What? Let us first try to understand what is a P value. P value is used in context of null hypothesis testing in order to quantify the statistical significance of evidence. In null hypothesis testing, a claim is assumed to be valid if its counterclaim is improbable. P hacking, which is also known as data phishing or data snooping, is a term coined in 2014 by Regina Nozo Nager. It is the misuse of data analytics to find patterns in data that can be presented as statistically insignificant, dramatically increasing, and understating the risk of false positive. This is done by performing many statistical tests on the data and only reporting those that come back with significant results. Now, let's understand a very important uh, area, which is FAT. It is an emerging area. What does FAT stand for? Fairness, accountability, and transparency. Now, we will go step by step to understand. To give an overall view, algorithm systems contain inherent risks such as codifying and entrenching biases, reducing accountability, and hindering due process. Being able to quantify and reason about issues of fairness, accountability, and transparency, which is again related to re uh, reproducibility, has emerged as an important research area. As evidenced by the books and conference as well, the ACM Conference of Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, this conference also uh, brings together a diverse community of researchers from computer science, law, social science, and much humanities, and many more backgrounds to come together and investigate and tackle issues related to fact. In the next few slides, we'll see some examples. Now, fairness. Fact, the first term is fairness. It is important that an algorithm is, has to be fair. For example, classifying people in ways that are consistent with common sense notions of fairness. 
for example uh, let's take a example we wouldn't think it's ethical for a bank to offer one set uh, one set of lending terms to minority applicants and another to white applicants but as recent work has shown most notably in the book called weapons of math destruction by the mathematician kathy o'neil discrimination that we reject in normal life can creep into algorithms okay now let us try to understand this a bit more with an example suppose you had a minority group in which smart students were steered towards maths and science this is one group then we had another dominant group in which smart students were steered towards finance now if someone wanted to write a quick and dirty classifying algorithm to find the smart students they might look for students who study finance because the majority is much bigger than the minority it is the dominant group however the problem is that not only is this unfair to the minority class but it is it has also reduced the utility compared to classifier that understands that if you are a member of the minority and you study math you should be viewed as similar to a member of the majority who studies finance they are both smart students right so individual fairness is also not enough to ensure group fairness for uh, let's take another example suppose you're looking at college admissions and you're thinking about using test scores as an admission criteria if you have two groups that have very different performances on standardized tests then you won't get group fairness if you have one threshold for the standardized test score different groups need to have different thresholds based on the level so these are some things that uh, uh, discrimination against aggregate outcome and discrimination against individual that arise with it now let's see another example look at this picture present on the screen why is the uh, why is computer advice on parole controversial so another very common example of algorithmic fairness are the algorithms frequently used in sentencing and parole which generate a score uh, score predicting the likelihood of an individual committing a future crime however it is not clear the algorithms are predictive and they seem to show rate races disparities for example pro uh, probablica obtained the risk scores assigned by one such algorithm to more than 7000 people arrested in broward county florida in 2013 and 2014 and check to see how many were charged with new crimes over the next two years they found that the scores were remarkably unreliable in forecasting the violent crime only 20% of the people predicted to commit violent crimes actually went on to do so when a full range of crimes were taken into account including misdemeanors such as driving with unexpired license the algorithm was only somewhat more accurate than flipping a coin which is hardly a 50% they also discovered significant racial bias in the disparities in forecasting who would reoffend the algorithm made mistakes with black and white defendants at roughly the same rate but in every in different ways the formula was particularly more falsely uh, flag black defendants as future criminals wrongly labeling them this way at almost twice the rate of white defendants white defendants were mislabeled as low risk way more often than black defendants this showed a very big color bias so moving ahead what was the third factor transparency you can also call it reproducibility generally speaking transparency means that data as well as information describing the data also known as metadata it is a describe uh, it is a raw data and the research analysis uh, should be made available this enables the re reproducibility of research results however this is hard to achieve since the algorithms in particular the machine learning algorithms are frequently complicated and it is often difficult to understand the dependencies between data and code furthermore when the algorithms may be black boxes 
making it even more impossible to open them up and reason about the results they are giving. This leads to huge privacy issues associated with the data that it cannot be shared. Right. So after this comes the question of facilitating re uh, reproducibility. The FAIR data principles were proposed as a guideline for those wishing to enhance the transparency of their data and research results, as opposed to other in in initiatives that focus on the human side of things. These principles put specific emphasis on the ability of machines to automatically find and use the data in addition to supporting its reuse by individuals. The, to facilitate reproducibility, the FAIR principles have been proposed, which are findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, four main principles. There is a lot of ongoing research on how to facilitate uh, reproducibility, especially with respect to provenance, understanding the why and where of the data. Examples including providing provenance, uh, tracking environments for different execution uh, environments. A uh, very good example is Jupyter Notebooks or R Markdown source documents and understanding the provenance through machine learning operations. Okay, so all in all, a summarization of what is data ethics is that ethics is about following a code of conduct for every research. That is get IRB approval, op uh, inf uh, obtain informed consent for the, from the people in involved, protect the privacy of subjects, maintain the confidentiality of the data collected, and most importantly, minimize the harm. Fairness, fairness is more subtle, but it tells that every group should be equally treated, be it minority or majority. The sample data should be an equal representative of all classes and should avoid false positive rates. The technical aspects include the algorithmic differences that may lead the differential privacy, data provenance, the trade-off between optimizing outcomes versus avoiding discrimination against a different group. All of these come together that data is a very important thing and it should be followed for any research that is being conducting. The sample should be well representative and it should not violate anyone's priority. The harm should be minimized and the correctness of the result should be maximized. Thank you so much.